You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. So it begins again. Welcome back to Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 124. Memorial Day and military encounters with cryptids and the supernatural. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello there. Yeah. So welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. As if, you're, uh, if, you, if this is your very first time listening, thank you. Thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Yeah. Why do you keep looking at me like that for? I'm just looking. You look at your screen. I am. Pay attention to your screen. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And this podcast is all about what? Well, broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our Creek Geeks Bunker Studio in the mountains of Western North Carolina. We're an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, paranormal, and tech topics circulating the web. Yes. And this podcast is broadcast on all major platforms. If you'd like to listen to it, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. Google Play Podcasts. Google Play Podcasts. What else? Um, Pod FM. Or... Everywhere. Basically, yeah. anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find us. Yeah. Yeah. We also have a Facebook group. It's called the Creep Geeks Facebook group. <laughs> Pretty original, I know. Yeah. And we also have uh, a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and you look for Creep Geeks, you'll find us as well. Mm-hmm. We're on Instagram at Creep Geeks Pod. We're on Twitter. We're everywhere. Yeah. So we're pretty easy to get a hold of. If you have something you'd like to share with the show, you can certainly do that. We have a phone number that you can call and leave a message. And that phone number is 575-208-4025. And you can also email us. That's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com. Yeah. We also have a website called creepgeeks.com. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a big old contact us link on the left hand side. Yes. Where you yeah. can like contact us. Yes. <laughs> and people are, li- first time listeners are like, what are they doing? <laughs> this is kind of what you have to do. Yeah. You kind of have to go through and tell everyone in the world where they can find you in hopes that they find you. Well, with the contact us and all the ways you can reach out to us as a podcast, we want to hear your stories. So. We'd appreciate it. If you have an unusual experience or you have something interesting, email us about it. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd like to share, we would appreciate it. Reach out. Don't be scared. (laughs) And if you'd like to support the podcast because you've been listening for a while, you can do this with little to no effort on your part. It won't cost you anything at all. It's real simple. Mm -hmm. When you shop on Amazon.com, if you use our affiliate link, we'll get a small percentage. doesn't change your price at all, and it helps us keep the coffee flowing and gas in the albino rhino. Our DIY camper van. <laughs> yes. So, this podcast is something we do, and we've been doing for a while. And just so you know, it seems to be that our podcast downloads have tripled. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. And so, for those of you who listen and leave little uh, comments and that sort of thing and reviews, is very much appreciated. Thank you. And we can't wait until our podcast total downloads quadruple. And become even more successful. <laughs> it's not a number. Yes, it is. It's quadruple. <laughs> quadruple. Yeah, quadruple. No. But no, you can help qua. us grow. Quadruple. You, you can help us grow. And by helping us grow, I mean give us a rating on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you listen to us on, give us a rating. That actually increases our visibility and allows other people to find our podcast. Yeah. We'll put a link to uh, how to give us a review or, well, We'll put a link to the review page if you f- yeah, in the show notes. Don't feel notes obligated. <laughs> you know, give us a rating. Give us a rating. <laughs> well, Guess what? Give us a rating. Um, no, it's just one of those things. We do yeah. have lots of different ways for you to, to do exactly that. But so. we'll put a link to it in the show notes. <clears throat> yeah. We'll make it real easy. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's kind of what we do. We make things easy for you. So you usually start off every podcast episode with an interesting random factoid. I do. 
What is your... I do. I do start that off. <laughs> yes. What is your interesting yeah. random yeah. factoid? That's true. I mean, that's exactly what I do. Is that our factoid? Yes. Moving no. on. <laughs> Actually, this is um, a little bit different. This Memorial Day that we're doing this podcast about military and stuff like that. So this particular interesting random factoid is about, guess what? What? Memorial Day. Oh. Yes. And I'd just like to say, uh, you know, Memorial Day is not out there grilling steaks and all that stuff and celebrating your day off. I mean, it is, but it's there for you to remember the people who have given their lives in service of the country. Oh. Yes. Right? Yes. So, according to History.com, ready? <clears throat> Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday of May honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. And Memorial Day 2019 occurs on May 27th, as we know that. Did you know that it was originally known as Decoration Day? No. Yes. That's weird. It is weird. Yeah. Because it, it basically originated, you know, in the wars following the Civil War. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the years following the Civil War. Yeah. And it became an official federal holiday in 1971. Okay. And that means that you actually got the day off. No, oh, that they officially yeah, decide the official we're going to close holiday. the banks and not right. not do mail that day. Okay, yes. and many Americans observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family gatherings, participating in parades, and unofficially it marks the beginning of the summer season. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it started around the Civil War. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, and it looks like the well, okay. So the Civil War, which ended in the spring of 1865, claimed more lives than any other conflict in U.S. history, and required the establishment of the country's first national cemeteries. Yeah. Now, now yeah. each year on Memorial Day, a national moment of remembrance takes place at 3 p.m. local time. Hmm. Did you know that? No, I didn't either. Actually, so. Wow. There you go. Now, there are, uh, it's unclear where it originated, this tradition, but people are saying, according to this article, <laughs> yeah. yes, that it's New York, hmm. like as in Waterloo, yeah, the official birthplace of Memorial Day. Okay. Because they were the first to celebrate it. There you go. So, yeah, once again, uh, it's remembrance, man. Yeah. So, we remember. And that's why we thought we'd do this podcast about, you know, since we do the strange, the weird, the wacky, the paranormal stuff, supernatural stuff, this podcast is going to be about a couple of different instances that happen with the military, right? Yeah. In relation to the stuff that we talk about, like cryptids and supernatural stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Now, <clears throat> since we're in an undisclosed location in Western North Carolina, <laughs> and we did talk about this one before. Um, what we're going to talk about because we're we're going to move on into talking about some of these instances where the military have uh, allegedly, if you're listening, military and government allegedly been involved. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure we're clear on that. But yeah, we did talk about this before. Uh, this happened in Boone, North Carolina. It's U.S. Special Forces Hunt Killer Bigfoot Group in Western North Carolina. You remember this? Yeah, and it was actually received by Dave Schrader, who I think is a significant paranormal person in the paranormal community. Um, a significant <laughs> I know, paranormal right? Paranormal person in the paranormal I'm, community. You know what? You passed on your "I can't talk to me." I know. I'm telling so you. So thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, you're uh, welcome, Dave Schrader. He is a icon in the paranormal community, and this was passed off to Phantoms and Monsters. But it basically talks about in the early 1990s, the person who sent the letter was with the teams in the Navy. and Uh, That would be the SEALs. Yes. They were sanctioned by an alphabet government agency to put a stop to several aggressive Sasquatch in the high country in western North Carolina. Now, I assume that's um, that's Boone, right? Yeah, they'd be like Boone. Yeah. uh, Spruce Pine, uh, Burnersville, all that stuff up that way. Now... It's interesting because this was a team of 12 on this particular SEAL team. The guy describes one of his buddies as being Native American and that they weren't very, they weren't sincere about the mission that they were given them. However, it was. They just just didn't take it seriously. They just didn't take it seriously. They thought it was a joke. Yeah. Right. 
And so they went to the mission briefing and they realized that it wasn't a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the thing that I find interesting is that they were shown slides of the damage or murders or harm that the Sasquatch had done to people, like adults and children, as well as vehicles and homes. They arrived in a little mountain village and the sheriff met with them. He was um, very happy to see them. And as he put it when he was giving a tour, this is where those effers, those big hairy demons, destroyed this or that. So, yeah. yeah. And he basically had said, um, he told the team that showed up, he'd never been so happy to see the cavalry since he'd been in Korea. Yeah. So, yeah. See, the thing is, is kind of weird about this whole thing. And, and one of the things that he does say when the person that sent this into Dave Trader said, yeah. yeah, his swim buddy or his swim partner, because they do that, they have partners, right? Yeah. Uh, was Native American. He said, this man wasn't scared of anything. Yeah. But before we were ordered to go out, and during the briefing, all the people that shows the slides of the creatures did and all that stuff, mm-hmm. sort of basically turned his buddy white with sheer fear. And he said, this is bad. Really bad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, if, if you've got somebody who's not afraid of anything, and this dude is afraid, it, it gets kind of kind of sketchy, right? So this is basically after they talked to the sheriff, the lieutenant told them to fire up. Because they were going hunting, right? Yeah. And they don't really give too many details about, like, where they are. Uh, it says, as uh, we were getting our gear ready, my buddy said to me, you know, I've always thought my grandfather was just telling me scary stories about he and his brothers when they fought the wild men. Yeah. So, that's already something, right? Yeah. And so, his brother <laughs> and his, so he, he heard the stories from his, his grandfather about the wild men. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of sketchy, I guess. And, it's, and it's kind of something I would have rather been more interested in that being an article or a, a letter submission because that's also... Well, I can see where this would yeah. <clears throat> kind of tie into all of that stuff because, you know, there's a there's the thing going around that the military has or the idea or the notion that the military actually has, like, kill teams yeah, to go in and take care of this. And there's also... See, it's kind of weird because I actually have a, a follow-up sort of article to this, too, where a lot of people think that they'll just go in and tranquilize. Like, the government knows all about Bigfoots and other cryptids and stuff. And that when bad things happen, right, like, mm-hmm. for example, this this group of Bigfoots, you know, killing people and destroying property and that sort of thing, that, you know, the team would show up and they tranquilize them and they relocate them. Yeah. I don't necessarily know... Or think that I believe in that. If there is such a thing. Yeah. Right? I think as soon as, if Bigfoots are real, and they do something bad to humans, right? Yeah. I don't think that they get relocated at all. I think they get exterminated. Because part of this ties into the theory that when some of these Bigfoots go bad, yeah, um, as they are large animals, they have a tendency to eat right yeah as in eat humans well kind of like the one of the very earliest reports where a human's remains were stuffed into a tree yeah almost like they were being stored there yeah yeah Yeah. and and that was like more of one of the old um west or pacific northwest um like wild men descriptions yeah and for me i mean that would be logical sense in the sense that like okay so if a wolf or a dog attacks a human and tastes human, they have to put it down. Yeah. You know? So I know Bigfoot's much more sentient, or allegedly senti- more sentient. Yeah. Sentient. Sentient, yeah. I mean, it would make sense to put him down as well. Well, yeah. I mean, if you have, uh, you know, humans eat humans, they get locked away. But, you know, it sort of ties into a couple of different things. It ties into, you know, some of the older Bigfoot wild men attacking humans and eating them and they become a problem and then like the early and some of the Native American tribes banded together and got rid of them you know the theory is with the government having teams to go in and take care of these problems in other words that they know about it that's been a theory for a long time there's mm-hmm. also another theory that um, most governments in most countries have something like this to deal with them as well 
and that there has been like multinational, um, <clears throat> multi-country teams that are already in place to take care of some of this stuff if it happens. There's also been reports of some national parks and, and parts of these national parks being closed down and the military showing up. Well, and they won't say why. They just kind of like, oh, you need to get out of the area kind of a thing. Oh, it's kind of dangerous. And see, something like that happened in New Mexico, like in the northern forests, like in Jimenez and yeah. um, the San Juan, I think it's called. It's happened in Arizona. It's happened yeah. in most national parks that, you know, if you start looking at it and if you can find the instances that it seems like it, it happens more often than we would think, you just never hear about it. Because we actually talked about that. It was weird because why would they show up? And this was kind of unrelated until you started looking at the little pieces like near natural disasters, like like forest fires and yeah. stuff like that. So and also with the missing hiker cases and yeah. the missing you know people cases in these national forests, why would the government just kind of show up out of nowhere? Yeah. And so that's kind of a sort of tie-in possibly to this whole sort of thing. And then um, another theory is, and so far the only one I've ever heard say this, it was cryptid guy. And this is about, um, probably about the most interesting thing I've heard him say about this, was that he thinks that from Teddy Roosevelt time, that, you know, Teddy Roosevelt allegedly encountered Bigfoot, right? Yeah. Um, and since Bigfoot was encountered and all this sort of thing, um, and they realized that this is not just like a, 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 a you know, one-off sort of incident, that it's, it's a whole species where they set aside a lots of lots and lots of land, like national park land, to be undeveloped and un, un um, you know uninhabited by humans, if you will, yeah, to sort of keep keep them at bay and see, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when you think about okay, if you're doing that and you have a team that goes in and takes care of like rogue element Bigfoot type things, like whether it's a, a group or a bunch of you know adolescent males or whatever it is, yeah, and you know about it. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It really, if you start thinking, okay, you know, the national parks being the way they are and where they're at and all the government land and the Bureau sort of land management land, you know, not being developed, it just kind of makes it sort and of see, weird. So, I mean, his his theory become slightly more plausible. And see, I had heard that same theory, though, the one that uh, the cryptid guy had said about Bigfoot and the national forests, national forests, national parks, national monuments, wilderness, BLM. I have heard that same theory, but about portals. And then there is all this supporting evidence about the portals because of why there's so much more of all that in the West and the Southwest than there is on on the East. It's also why Bureau of Land Management, BLM, they manage certain land territories. There's not, there's barely any BLM over here east of the Mississippi. Yeah. And so it's interesting that, you know, the cryptic guy brought that up for Bigfoot. I've heard it for portals and power areas and things like that. So if there's a correlation there, that that would be mind blowing to me. Well, so, I mean, it could be related to both. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, portals and cryptid type things. And there's so much wilderness out here on the East Coast as well. So why isn't all of it also covered by, you know, National Parks Foundation? You know, yeah, things like that. <coughs> so. Yeah, I don't know. But going back to what they were saying in this article we were reading, they started at about 2 o'clock. And by 4 o'clock, they found lots and lots of tracks. They started tracking them. They made out to be at least seven different individuals. They said they made first contact around 7.30, where it was almost dark. Yeah. And the point man stopped dead in his tracks and spoke into his head said, I see one. It's effing huge. And the lieutenant said, if you have a shot, take it. And so he shot this massive hairy beast with a 7.62 millimeter round and it acted like a mosquito bidding. Is that big or it's significant? big enough. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's what they use in more. They're, they're not, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's pretty, yeah, it has a lot of velocity behind it. And the creature turned around and let out a god-awful roar. And at that point, the point man quickly switched to full auto. And this time, the, the creature dropped like a rock after getting shot with 10 7.62 millimeter rounds. So he got shot 10 times. So from a military standpoint, though, just if we were to remove the word Bigfoot and put like large man from one shot takes you out. Well, so is that paragraph? Does it make sense like military and gun wise? Because I'm not gun wise. Yeah. I mean, the way 
Navy SEALs are trained. They don't, they, they're not trained to waste ammunition. Okay. They're typically trained to take a couple shots, right, to make sure that whatever they're shooting is down. They, they do controlled shots. They're very accurate with what they do. You know, they wouldn't go to full auto unless they need, because whatever they carry, whenever they have an op or an operation, right, they, what they have is what they have. So they have to carry in all their stuff, and they take all their stuff with them. So they're not one to overload and carry tons and tons and tons of ammo. You know okay. what I mean? So and they're real precise in what they do. Yeah. Very controlled when they shoot. They don't just go show up and just randomly start spraying everybody down with, you know, automatic weapons fire. You know, they, you see it on TV all the time, right? They pop up and then they keep going, pop up and they keep going. Yeah, that's how they train. That's what they do. Now it may be different for different circumstances and situations. I don't know. I've never been a Navy SEAL. You know what I mean, or anything like that. Although I did do some training with some SEALs when I was at Thirty Second Street. In the military where we were learning how to become base police and that sort of thing where they had we all had duties assigned to us and i had to go and go to the uh marine police force or security force cadre out there and go through all that stuff and there was a bunch of seals there that were there learning for something i'm not sure why they were there exactly but hmm. you know and they didn't have any problems at all passing the, the firearms qualifications like not a bit <laughs> no. so i mean they're real precise in what they do they train very heavily so to go full auto you know, it would be, it's kind of a weird thing, but and it, it's not weird in the situation you're in. Okay. You know, I think, I do think the second pair or the next paragraph is a little weird because the description kind of reminds me of, I think like a scene from predator or something with having a casualty with a team member who was snatched straight up into a tree. Yeah. They found the remains or they found the missing people, or as they put it, the remains of what was left of them. Um, there was nothing they could do to help. Uh, the guy that was lost and to this day thinking of those three days that they were on this mission still sends chills down this person's spine yeah and you won't find those three days in any military record or mission log nope so i don't know I, it, yeah they were simply told that in the past three days they were doing rigorous mountain training yeah and during that training period they lost a man was what they were saying so hmm yeah. It says, to answer your next question, after three days, government agents came in and removed all seven corpses and flew them out. Wow. So if these guys came in, these SEAL team people, these operators, whatever you want to call them, uh, came in and took care of business and lost one, that's, that's probably pretty good considering how big these things are supposed to be. Yeah. So, you know, and I don't know, because it seems like uh, you, you hear a lot. If you start looking, you see a lot and hear a lot about military being involved in cryptids and stuff like that so yeah but this is more of an active story hmm. where they will send something in like a team which i thought was pretty weird right and the first time i read it, i was pretty interested in it because of where it was located like boone yeah i was like well that's not too far away in the grand scheme of things but the next article was more uh of a link i seen that took me to a like a, a comment page off of the sasquatch chronicles Okay. You ever heard of that? Uh, actually, I think we follow them on Facebook. So That is a possibility. I wasn't sure if we followed them or not, but... We do. <laughs> I just checked. Okay. <laughs> With the Sasquatch Chronicles, Yeah. when I was doing some searching to, to find instances where the military is involved in cryptids and supernatural and that kind of thing for Memorial Day here, yeah. right? the subject came up between encounters with various military units and cryptid creatures, right? And so in the Sasquatch Chronicles... Uh, there's a little uh, forum post. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, May 28th, 2018. And the person said the subject is fascinating for a while, you know, but, you know, basically with the encounters between various military units and cryptic creatures. And they, he listened to a few, you know, talks um, where they included things about talking about the Predator drones and personnel and ghillie suits and all that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Um, but there's, in one of the recent episodes... Uh, there's a former so former so soldier named Michael, where they talk about a couple different things, right? Yeah. About, and these are different cases, and they didn't really go into the case so much, but they talk about cryptic creatures will be displaced, and they the more likely encounter uh, humans, right? So as they're wherever they're at gets, you know, 
deforested or whatever. Or built up or yeah. developed. You know, you, yeah. wildlife has to move, you know, to kind of survive. And it becomes obvious that if you take away the land where something is, that it's going to be more hard to hide. So the chances of uh, human encounters are pretty, pretty well, they're increased, right? Yeah. So uh, he basically yeah. said that, uh, you know, so some of these animals or you know, some of these cryptids will become aggressive. Others become benevolent and some indifferent. Yeah. Uh, but clearly the most aggressive ones, they will attack humans. And I can't imagine the U.S. government or any other agency not having some sort of response to this. Hmm. So the way they're putting it out there is that if these things are out there and they are aggressive, then the government would probably know about it and have a, a response. Yeah. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. And it says, uh, I think in some cases there's Bigfoot who are migratory and travel in family units. They're less likely to be a danger and would be sedated or moved on. And the aggressive ones would be single males who've been more aggressive and confrontational and will require an armed response. Hmm. So, <laughs> and they also talk about dogmen being kind of the same thing. Like, they also think that, you know, some of the dogmans that may have been seen that are more rabid or feral yeah. are more than likely to have military units set aside to deal with them. Hmm. And so when I read this, I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, we've heard on Mysterious Universe where they've talked about, you know, people saying that, you know, again, they're in parks and military just kind of shows up. Yeah. And asks them, hey, have you guys seen anything weird? That kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, oh, well, okay. So a lot of the stuff that we've heard sort of in passing sort of ties into this, you know, just by instance. It's like, okay, so, mil you know, <clears throat> excuse me, military being seen in national parks, missing, right? The missing 401 stuff, military shows up there. Yeah. Military in weird random places that shouldn't be there. Closing down parts of parks and riding around on ATVs and, and four-wheelers and stuff, telling people that they should be careful and leave. Yeah. You know? Having these weird training exercises in places where they would normally never have training exercises. I mean, they have military bases. Yeah. There's training areas. Why would they train like in the mountains of Boone, right? Or somewhere like that. So some of the comments that sort of came after this, this article were pretty interesting, right? Yeah. It says, and this one person says, there are attacks by beasts on military installations, dependent and civilians as well as troops, as well as troops get hurt or killed. When the things start eating folks around the country... Troops or specialists are deployed. Mm -hmm. Oregon caves close when the sightings go up along the disappearances of tourists. It's like, okay, so Oregon caves close when the sightings go up, right? Yeah. So when they have more sightings and tourists start to disappear, they close the park and they bring in the specialists to handle the eaters. Oh. I don't care a bit about the poor Bigfoot getting dead. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they get what they earned by feeding on humans. For those... Who claim they are human and that we are at war with the vicious enemy who eats his victims other war. What other way, you know, do you deal with it than that? Right? Yeah. So. I'm That's interesting, like, though, because that makes me want to look up, like, the organ cave yeah, systems and things like that. Exactly. And that's kind of why I put this in here, because I started yeah. reading more about us. This is history of the wars that they have fought around the world is to be understood. Here the tribes made peace after the war, right? Mm -hmm. And the places were set aside. Even when those places are still theirs, theirs, as in the, the big yeah. ones, they push to see how far they can reach before we hit back. Deforestation is good for them as deer herds expand, thus their food supply increases because deer needs to graze and, and not in opening of trees and stuff. You know, So they basically, basically can starve the creatures that the, the prey relies on. So this world is a machine and each of us needs to learn how it works without the foolish city boy ideas of uh, all, all the being like manicured lawns and parks and stuff. In other words, it's the wild, man. I don't know. I, I take a little bit of offense to that one particular comment, though, because what we've noticed, especially living in New Mexico, is a lot of these national parks, forests, wilderness areas, protected areas, they butt up against native land. Yeah. So any encroachment or something like that, the federal government only has so much jurisdiction, jurisdiction in the event that... Right these cryptids were to, you know, spread outward. So this whole, oh, they're just testing their the boundaries and stuff like that. I kind of have a problem with that because if they were to test the boundary, basically they'd be testing the boundary on, like, the Navajo reservation or something. Well, if, okay, yeah. so what? And from the previous if episodes... If you're Bigfoot, you don't care. Yeah, I know. But What's the natives going to do? And that's my 
problem. They're limited in what they can do. I mean. Yeah, but I mean, that's what I'm saying. And their response yeah. would probably be a bit, little bit different. Yeah. They would probably let them go, you know, try to be in, in harmonious existence. Yeah. But at the same time, as in the previous article, that native fellow who was on that SEAL team was talking about how his grandfather and his father went out and basically was fighting these things. And we've heard stories where the cryptid is more on the supernatural spectrum. spectrum. So instead of Dogman, it would be like a skinwalker. And then we've we've talked about the paranormal rangers where they've dealt with it in their own way as well. Yeah. You know, so I don't, I don't know if I totally agree with this guy with the whole, you know, um, shoot first type thing because I kind of feel like... Well, he, he's, he yeah. was talking about the correlation between, you know... The eaters. Yeah. That that's the only way to deal with the eaters. Yeah. And I like how he calls them the eaters. Yeah. It's just kind of creepy. But one of the comments talked about the Oregon Caves getting shut down. Which happened a lot like two years ago. Yeah. And then they also talk about, you know, how the park and yeah. people that work for the parks and when the caves get shut down, how Coast to Coast basically talked about this a while back. And this was years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And it says, for years now, when they get a large number of sightings uh, around the park and the surrounding area... Right where people go missing, the park shut down, shuts down. Uh, hunters are brought in, right? Yeah. And then they basically take care of it. Hmm. So if you have parks where they um, are seen, find out if missing person cases rise with the sightings, and whether they close the park up for a week or two. Sometimes parts of the park may be closed if the park is big enough. Yeah. So not the entire park. Which almost makes you wonder, you know, like when you have like natural disasters, like forest fires and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, what happens there? And there was a, that story that we heard or read about, I think it was last year, where when Mount St. Helens blew up, um, this guy was, was hired on as part of like park rangers and stuff like that, as like seasonal help mm-hmm. to basically work for the park, but he was assigned to sort of stay and watch, if you will, over a uh, a um, huge pile of Sasquatch, like burn up, like bodies with Sasquatch. Large animal corpses yeah. that had fallen during the fire. Yeah, yeah. in Mount St. Helens. So. So. Yeah, so they, they keep talking about this sort of thing, and then it's like, and another comment said, I just read a report out of Arizona that I can't get to now. Very briefly, it said that they encountered heavily armed, heavily armed Army Special Forces groups on ATVs, Right? They said basically, uh, hey, uh, you should be careful out there. And that later on that night, a group of campers were harassed by Bigfoot. Yeah. But yeah, I like that. Saw special forces on quad runners and three wheelers with high powered weapons and tranquilizer guns. That was in 1987 in Gila Bend, Arizona. Yeah. I've been to Gila Bend, Arizona. Oh, and this was uh, towards uh, Painted Rock Lake. Yeah. So. And you go through Gila Bend as you're heading towards like San Diego. So. Yeah. Just kind of weird. But I like the way some of the comments went. You know, when they're talking about it. It's like, hmm. They actually mentioned um, Mike Barra. Oh. As being a level-headed, logical-type researcher that would probably be good to talk about this. Cool. So, anyway, I thought that was kind of strange, right? So, I'm like, oh, okay. That kind of sort of ties in with what we've heard before. And then I came across something a little bit different. Yeah. What is this? What? This article is from the National Cryptid Society. Dot org, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it says three government documents concerning cryptids. Okay. And it says on a few occasions the United States government has addressed creatures generally relegated to the uh, the realm of cryptozoology, and they're sharing these three obscure United States government documents that mention, pertain, or otherwise are about the Yeti, Bigfoot, <laughs> the Loch Ness monster, and other creature, creatures creatures uh, whose existence is unsubstantiated. By science or recognized by science, right? Mm-hmm. So the first one is the Department of State Yeti Dispatch. And it says regulations concerning mountain climbing expeditions in Nepal related to Yeti. Okay. And it was dated November 30th, 1959 by the American Embassy in Kathmandu to the Department of State in Washington, D.C. In the dispatch, three regulations detail procedures in which explorers were to adhere to when hunting Yeti in Nepal. Okay. Basically saying how much Indian currency you're going to have to pay to the government of Nepal. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's part of it. And then, um, in the case that Yeti is, is traced, 
or it can be basically photographed or caught alive, but it must not be killed or shot at, except in an emergency arising out of self-defense. All photographs taken of the animal, the creature itself, uh, if captured alive or dead, must be surrendered to the government of Nepal at the earliest time. <clears throat> so that was number two, as far as the three things you have to do. Mm-hmm. And the news and reports throwing light on the actual existence of the creature must be submitted to the government of Nepal as soon as they are available and must not be in any way given out to the press or reporters for publicity without permission of the government of Nepal. So these are guidelines. If you're over in Nepal hunting Yeti, yeah, these are like the guidelines that they would hand you from the American embassy if you're like a tourist or something. You know, saying, hey, and I'm, don't do this. I'm looking it don't up now. That. And it, they actually have a foreign service dispatch. Yeah. So basically you're paying 5,000 rupees, which is 70 bucks back in the 1959. Yeah. So it's 70 bucks today. It was probably less back then. Still yeah, it's 70 like $7 bucks. Or something. You know, but you, you're paying for a permit and you still have to turn over all evidence to the government of Nepal. No. Yeah. That's not and that's fair. from the Department of State. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, wow. And that's an unclassified document. So I'm like, well, that's kind of strange. And yeah. It doesn't really say anything. It just basically says, if you're going out there looking for it, these are some guidelines that you have to adhere. And it says, and here's the next one I thought was pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. This is from the United States Army Corps of Engineers in 1975 from the Washington Environmental Atlas, which is also known as uh, the Preventional U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Reconnaissance Inventory of the State of Washington. Yeah. It's like okie dokie. And it says, the very existence of Sasquatch or Bigfoot, as it's sometimes known, is hotly disputed. So some profess to be open minds. So anyway, it kind of keeps going. But it, it talks about information from alleged sightings, tracks, and other experiences. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of like the guidebook you're looking in as you're reading it. And it actually talks about Sasquatch. And it says, if Sasquatch is purely legendary, the legend is likely to be a long time in dying. Another, on the other hand, if Sasquatch does exist... Then the Sasquatch hunts being mounted in increasing, uh, and increasing uh, human population, it seems very likely that some hard evidence may soon be at hand. Whether it be legendary or actual, Sas Sasquatch just excites a great popular interest in Washington. Huh. But they talk about some things in here that I thought was pretty interesting. It's apparently able to sleep, to see at night. It's yeah. extremely shy. It leaves minimal evidence of its existence and its presence. Or its presence, I should say. Tracks are presently the best evidence of its existence. A short film of alleged female Sasquatch was shot in Northern California, which, although scoffed at, shows no indication of fabrication. Plaster casts have been made of tracks showing a large squarish foot, 14 to 24 inches in length and about 5 to 10 inches in width. Reported to feed on vegetation and some meat. The Sasquatch is covered with long hair, except for... This is in a government book. Yeah. This is in your Army Corps of Engineer handbook thing that you're looking at for the state of Washington. See, I want to try to find this, though, because I'm trying to follow the links and they're broken. Yeah, well, it says, you know, and they even talk about the possibility of being between 8 and 12 feet tall, weighing, excess of, weighing in excess of 1,000 pounds, mm -hmm. taking strides up to 6 feet. Why would the government put this in here? I don't know. The one This thing is, is like in the book. And well, okay. So one of the screenshots in, in your this, field guide. Yeah, one of the screenshots though is an AP Press article, and there's no date on it. Right. So I wanted to see maybe it was an April Fool's prank or something like that, you know? Uh. -uh. And I can't find it. So. In a short film of an alleged female Sasquatch, that's Patty. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of crazy. They actually put that in the Army Corps of Engineers, basically the field guide for Washington State. Hmm. Yeah. And then there was another one from the Department of Interior, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, that in 1977, they posted, it says, are we ready for Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster? Hmm. And they're basically going through saying, you know, are you prepared, basically? What are you going to do if this is, becomes a thing? Oh, and didn't we do, like, the top cryptids nobody's ever heard of? And yeah. there is, like, a Loch Ness, <clears throat> there's a water cryptid up in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah. Yeah. That was... That was Claude. Yeah. <laughs> Colossal Claude, right? Yeah. But yeah, it, it basically, it, it, it's sort of like, so, okay, so this article, in, or this, this government document basically says, hey, not saying it's real or anything, but what are you going to do if it is? Like, you should be prepared for that. 
Mm -hmm. which is weird well if you think about it i I think it's very practical though even if it i'm wondering if the rest of the article broaches the subject but if a cryptid was found like uh daniel had a great point if a cryptid was found, it would increase tourism and increase visitation of an area that National Park Service says to protect the pristine lands of, yeah. which means people are going to flood the area, they're going to litter, they're going to camp, they're not going to clean up after their camp, they're going to cause damage to the ecosystem, and not just to Bigfoot, but to the other creatures that live there peacefully. Sure. So <clears throat> yeah. I would understand the Department of Interior being concerned. I think it'd be different, personally. I think that these things aren't nice. Yeah. You know, they would be the smartest thing in the woods, period. They kill and eat people. Yeah. I think that when you, when you you know, come across some of the articles where, you know, like hunters being ripped in half and stuffed in trees. Yeah. You know, things like that. I think that if you run across these things and you encroach on their territory, this sort of thing happens. But And I, I think it's a, it's a huge threat. That if the government knows about this, that they want to kind of keep it secret. But that's kind of my side point was not necessarily that. Yes, they could be violent. Yes, they could. You know, all these different possibilities that we could suppose. Um, but more of if if they were violent, then that would actually increase even more because more aggressive hunters, more ammo is going to be brought out there. Just more resources are going to be out there destroying the pristine national park yeah, area. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're worried about that because they, they, in the grand scheme of things, they do it anyway. Well, With yeah. The strip mining and the fracking and all the other stuff that goes down, I think that you know they don't want to lose money. I think if you knew that if you knew that if you went to a national park, there's a likelihood that you'd run into a sasquatch that could rip you in half and will more than likely eat you. Would you go? Me as a smart person, <clears throat> no. No. I think a lot of people wouldn't go. Like, let me give you the example of Jaws. When that movie came out, tourism and all the places that had oceanfront, right, like beaches, dropped. Mm-hmm. Nobody went to the beach. Hmm. This is in the 70s, and I remember. Like, it was, like, very scary. But we also live in the millennial YOLO, let me live stream this generation. I, I know, but for so. the most part, people aren't going to go, I don't think. Hmm. And you take away that into Department of Interior money, all that money will go away. Hmm. I think they know about it. I think that they have known about it. And I think that if they basically said, hey, the reason why 4,000 people go missing national parks every year is because Bigfoot gets them, that's a problem. You no, because <clears throat> you're going to have people petitioning the, na- the government. Well, of course, but it doesn't matter. They don't care. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want people to know about it. They don't, they hmm. don't have to worry about it. Because the government's job is to protect the people, right? Yeah. So, but, <clears throat> how are you going to do that? I mean, think of how many people the <coughs> national parks Excuse and national monuments employ. If if it did come to light that, you know, cryptids were real and they're aggressive and they're the cause of disappearances, you would not be able to f- fill a single ranger position in any of the uh, Bigfoot hotspots at all. Which means there would be nobody out there to even protect you or find your remains. I, <clears throat> I, so. I think I, I think they just don't want to deal with it. Hmm. I think it's easier to keep it quiet than it is to acknowledge the fact that things like giants and Bigfoots and stuff like that actually exist. Because what if this is actually something that they want to keep quiet because it could lead to something bigger? Well, didn't you, know? you didn't <clears throat> we talk to a former person who worked for? A place in New Mexico, and he said, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah we did. <coughs> Excuse me. All this Bigfoot talk, got some Sasquatch hair in my throat. Oh, God. <laughs> so, but I thought those three documents were kind of interesting. I was like, well, okay, that's kind of crazy. And then I came across a couple different things. Yeah. Use a little bit more lighthearted. <laughs> <laughs> Which really? They, no, they're not. <laughs> And this came from <clears throat> Mysterious Universe, where it talked about military encounters with supernatural demonic entities. And see, this interests me because I've never heard of something like this. Yeah. Um, I'm now, not going to talk about the first one, so you oh. just better back off. I know what you're trying to do. No, not, not that. I'm trying to give your throat a break. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, the, it's the pollen, man. Mm-hmm. Well, see, and this kind of also ties in. Okay, you talked about portals and the government knowing about that and maybe keeping some of the parks, you know, sort of locked off. 
because of the portals, right? Mm -hmm. We also sort of mentioned stairs to nowhere. Yes. So what if those portals were there for a while and then they dried up and moved on, right? Transient, yes. Yeah, because, I mean, it can happen. They're there for a certain period of time, then they go away. So some of these stairs to nowhere would make sense if you're going to walk up the stairs and pop off into a portal. And then eventually the portal disappears. Maybe it comes back in 20 years or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. So maybe that's part of it, too. Maybe there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in these parks and stuff that the government needs to keep quiet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you you certainly wouldn't want any part of what you're trying to keep secret to get out, because you would attract a bunch of people that would be there. Hmm. You know, I mean, you, there will be you know, of course, it's a small number, but there will be a large number of stupid people that would go out there, just like in the movie Jaws. When they had all those people in their boats, like all those yahoos out there just shooting <laughs> shotguns in the water, right? There's a shark, and they shoot it, you know, where they were shooting like fish and stuff. But, yeah. Okay. So, there's a couple different things, right? The first thing we're going to talk about is this is during World War II. And this is what supernatural demonic entities? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then it's been talked about on Mysterious Universe before. Where they talk about gremlins, right? Mm -hmm. Devilish looking little beasts known as gremlins. They're gnome like, somewhat re reptilian creatures that have often been reported uh, by pilots during the war on all sides of the conflict. Yeah. Most of the time, gremlins weren't really talked about as in, you know, what they were or what they looked like, you know, it's sort of like. It was more like the damage they caused or yeah. the mischief they caused. Yeah, and you kind of heard about, oh, I didn't really see one. But, you know, <clears throat> in the old World War II stuff, you'd see, like, pictures of the, what looked like goblins, really. Yeah. Like, what you think a goblin would actually look like. Yeah. And so this person, who was uh, only wanted to be identified by the initials LW, was a Boeing B-17 pilot during the war. And not only believes that many of the plane failures were due to the activities of these mischievous little creatures, right? Mm -hmm. The gremlins but also claims to have had a close encounter with one. Huh. Yeah. He said that during one of the missions that uh, he was on his aircraft had sudden technical difficulties. Okay. And that when he went and investigated what the technical difficulty was, he came face to face with one of the legendary gremlins. He said they were about three feet tall, had hairless gray skin, Long, pointy ears and red eyes. Wow, that sounds very much like Hellier. <laughs> well, not <laughs> Except Hellier. Except for the... It sounds yeah. very much like the description... Of the Kentucky of, goblins. Of a goblin that except, they've seen in Hellier. Except for the eyes. Or not that they've seen, but... The color of the eyes. That's well, a little different. No, they were red in there, too. Some, yeah. Well, okay. If 95% of the freaking description matches what somebody else says, you can let something like on a part okay. of it go, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, this guy says, so I'm very aware of my surroundings, and as I go higher, I notice an unusual sound coming from the engine, and the instruments went nuts. So, I look at my right, and I see an entity staring at me. And then I look at the aircraft's nose, and there's another one hanging in there, like dancing lizards, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It says, I was perfectly fine, my senses were in good shape, but the weird things were still there and still looking at me. They kept going at it, pounding the plane, plane with all their might. They appeared to be laughing, their big mouths open, looking at me, hitting the plane with their long arms, trying to pull stuff. Hmm. I have no doubt in my mind that they were trying to crash it. I managed to stabilize the flight and saw the critters falling off the aircraft. I don't know if they fell and died or if they jumped from my plane to a different one. I have no idea. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Weird. But they, there was a couple of curious accounts like that. Yeah. Where they talked about it. And this is on all sides of the war. And there was another one where, um, this was the one that I remember hearing about, which I thought was super crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is reported by a, uh, a U.S. Army corporal in 1970. Okay. This is the Vietnam time. <clears throat> and he was in second command of a squad of soldiers operating in a thickly jungled remote area just south of the demilitarized, demilitarized, DMZ, so I can't say it. Yeah. Okay. And so the witness claims that they had set up a bivouac <clears throat> in an area of steep hills. It's like camp, right? Mm -hmm. And said, uh, and then they set out on a night patrol around the surrounding vicinity. They encountered what they took to be enemy activity, and they hunkered down to wait it out. During which the time they only got fleeting glimpses of something moving through the brush. So this patrol is kind of hiding out because they, you know, 
Yeah. This is when the activity died down. They continued through the valley, and they were there until they, they basically hit a sheer wall of stone. So they were trying to get away, and they went up run into this sheer wall of stone. And okay. it looked as if someone had stacked these enormous boulders in front of it. It's like, okay, it's kind of weird. Yeah. It says the cave entrance was also visible. Yeah. Which looked like it had been cleanly carved into solid rock. It was very unlike anything they knew of the enemy caves, and they decided to get a closer look to investigate. Yeah. And it says as they got closer to it, a fetid, putrid smell like rotting eggs and human decay began to pervade the area, which seemed to be billowing out from the cave opening. So bad was the stench that several of the, several of the squad members became physically ill and vomiting in the, like, the bushes. Ew. So they took up positions in the jungle near the entrance, and they waited. Because they could hear in, like, strange rumbling sounds, right? Yeah. As dawn began to come, something very strange happened. And one of the eyewitnesses says... Just as we noticed, or just then we noticed movement in front of the cave. A being, at first I thought it was a man, moved through the entrance into the clearing in front of the cave. As it stood up from a crouch, it stood at least seven foot tall and started to look in our general direction. At the time, another similar looking creature was moving out of the cave. They were making a hellish hissing sound and looking directly at us. That's They're seven foot tall, though. That's unusual. Well, I, well, I mean... Hold on. Know. Yeah. The only way I can describe these things is that they look like upright lizards. They were scaly, oh. shiny skin, very dark, almost black. Snake-like faces and forward-set eyes that were very large. They had arms and legs like a human, but scaly skin. I didn't notice a tail. Although they wore long one-piece dark green robes and a um, with a dark cap-like covering for their heads. It says, I never noticed that they had anything on their feet. That's kind of weird, right? Yeah. No one gave the order, but it seemed like the entire squad opened up fire at once. <laughs> Which, I rightfully so, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. Every piece of vegetation between us <laughs> and them was quickly sheared away. Yeah. I yelled out a ceasefire order, and at the same time I was looking in the direction of the cave, there was nothing there. We immediately checked our flank just in case they came around there and circled us, but there was nothing. As mm. we approached the cave, ready to resume action if needed, it became apparent that these things, these beings had escaped, most likely back in the cave, and it was soon decided to set charges and close the cave entrance. entrance. Yeah. So, when they returned to camp, they all seemed to be in a daze. There was little discussion of the incident, and they never debriefed. So, their sergeant never filed a report. Yeah. Isn't that kind of weird, man? Yeah. That's kind of crazy. So it's very strange, very strange indeed. But see, that's not the only time I've heard that. You know, like that report of like reptiles. This is like in, in the jungle, in like different jungles places. Um, the Vietnam oh, one was pretty one. My uncle was stationed at the last one. In Germany? Yeah, at, yeah, yeah. He was stationed in there. In Morbach, Germany, right? Yeah. At the Han Air Force Base? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they seem to come across a strange wolf-like creature prowling about on two legs that was spotted from time to time. And he left in 1989, too. Yeah, and this is the accounts were from 1988. Yeah. And it says, one evening, a group of Air Force personnel were at the base when the sirens began shrieking into the dark, indicating that something tripped an alarm somewhere. Hmm. And base personnel went to investigate and apparently came across a bipedal wolf-like monstrosity standing eight to nine foot tall, right, which gazed menacingly at the soldiers before clearing a ten-foot fence. And when a tracker dog was brought in, it became only, it apparently became overwhelmed with fear at the location of the sighting, cowering and trembling in terror. And it, at the time, it seems that no one knew of a persistent legend in the area, right? Yeah. So they, you know, they, I guess they go out and ask people, they said, uh, no one knew of a persistent legend in the area of a creature that spans back to the time of Napoleon. Hmm. So according to the tales, a man named Johannes Schweitzer, or Schweitzer, and some others had deserted Napoleon's army, and they fled into the homeland where he went to, is like Alsace. And eventually he found himself in a German town of Wittlich, where they murdered the family of a farmer whose land they had been stealing from. So these oh. guys desert, and they, they kill the family because they were stealing from their land. Yeah. Right? And the legend says the farmer's wife qu- cursed them yeah. to become a howling beast on the full moon, after which the soldier had killed her as well. Yeah. And they basically say, hey, the curse worked. Dun, dun, dun. Huh. So if the curse worked, then that turned him into a werewolf, right? 
Yeah. So they say the story, the story said that the curse worked and it became a, a beast into full moon. And he went to murder, rape, and pillage as a bipedal wolf-like abomination. Um, continuing his reign until he was killed by a lynch mob of uh, villagers. And it's speculated that this legend may have something to do with the what the U.S. personnel saw. And an anthropologist from the College of Mainz, whose name was Matthias Bugard, check out these rep- reports of several instances of a bipedal wolf hand in the area. It says, you know, no one seems to really know. Yeah. And then tales of the Mormack monster continue to circulate. So that's a freaking werewolf, man. Yeah. So, werewolf, it's not really Dogman. If Dogman's more of a natural occurring thing, that's more like a werewolf. That's kind of crazy. So, more supernatural than the... Yeah, cursed. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, and there's a there's a couple more of stories like that, but I thought the werewolf thing was pretty crazy. Yeah. So, but yeah, there's one more. One more that I thought was really interesting. You want to want to hear it? Sure. Actually, there's more than one. There's a bunch of them. But this one I thought was pretty cool because it was relatively recent. You want to hear it? Bizarre yeah. encounters of the weird <clears throat> in the Middle East. Okay. So, yeah. There's, so there's been a bunch of strange stories come out of the Middle East, like Afghanistan, Iraq, and stuff like that. And one of the ones that came out, which I thought was pretty interesting, right, is that... Um, this, there's a person who worked for several years in Iraq and Afghanistan. They don't say really who he is, but he's part of the U.S. Army Criminal Investigations Team. Okay. Or division. So he investigates crimes amongst military personnel like bribery, theft, all that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. So in 2005, he was embedded with an uh, Army infantry unit to basically where they were. Or he was embedded in the unit, so... Um, only when they're embedded in the unit, there's something going on, at least from what I gathered. So anyway, he's with them, and they're in the uh, Iraqi region of Kurdistan. Yeah. So it's like Iraq, Kurdistan area. You know, I'm not really familiar with the with that region very much, but yeah. they have lots of rugged mountains around there. And they call it like the Sulaymaniyah uh, Governante, so it's in northwest, no, I'm sorry, northeast Iraq, near the Iranian border. So... So now you know where that is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know where it is either, right? So after being briefed on the general situation, he learned that there was some bizarre activity that had been occurring in that remote area concerning a mit- mysterious creature haunting the locals that no one was able to identify. Yeah. So you already got the locals who were saying something. And so according to the villagers of this isolated wilderness region, right, and the Kurdish military, people were being stalked and hunted by a beast Known, uh, known locally as the ghoul. Okay. Which is a very tall humanoid creature that has like disproportionately long arms and legs, which reportedly had a taste for human flesh. Oh. Yeah. So the witness was ordered to an area for an in depth investigation, and they, so they took him out there. And accompanied by an infantry squad, squad they, they went, basically went looking. And they thought that maybe they're going to, you know, come down to a crazed soldier who maybe had gone AWOL and just went around and started killing people, right? Mm-hmm. People go crazy. I mean, wartime, man, people could, you know, it can happen, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking it could be like an AWOL soldier. Um, a serial killer. Yeah, a freaking serial killer or something like that, you know, stresses of war. Yeah. Or also, I mean, it's a remote village. It could be a cover. Yeah. You know? So. And so they, they sort of investigated did a bunch of surveillance and they searched for a couple of days and they came up with nothing. So they began to think, okay, it's just like spooky stories. Nerves. Yeah. Yeah, but the villagers were adamant that something was hunting them and killing them to the point that many were afraid to leave their homes during the daytime. Hmm. So that wasn't weird enough, right? According to the witness, one evening he was going over uh, some reports with the squad leader when they reported hearing a shrill, unearthly scream echo through the air on the outside. Yeah. And it seemed to come from the direction of nearby military pa- or mountain pass. And it was, and it was, uh, they claimed, right, the villagers claimed that that scream was the very thing that had been terrorizing them. So armed soldiers, they uh, mobilized and they decided to head out to the pass to investigate the eerie otherworldly scream because whatever it was howled again several times. Huh. Right? So basically making your hair stand, stand on it, right? Yeah. They said it was an alarming, blood curdling sound unlike anything any of them had ever heard before, like no animal known to live in the area. 
And these heavily armed men were actually scared of what they might find out in the dark. So slowly and warily they found out into the dark to, con- to basically conduct the search. And then the witness described what happened. He says, within the hour, right, the squad and I slowly entered the pass. Um, it was night, but the moon was very bright, so we were able to see around a bit. We searched the entire area for several hours using night vision and high-intensity lights, and we found nothing, not even a footprint. Hmm. It's like, huh, nothing. They found nothing. <laughs> so it's like, okay. And so I read that, and I'm like, well, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? So uh, obviously the natives or the locals, yeah, they heard something, they were scared. <clears throat> Soldiers heard something. They were scared. This guy is embedded in there. He's he's basically CID. So, but the other story that I heard that seemed to remind me of this particular story was the same one that sort of followed us after this, where an American soldier claimed he had a very bizarre encounter in a remote area of southern Afghanistan. So we're going from the northeast down to the south. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and it says while, de- while he was deployed in that remote area, the witness said that he and a squad mate had set a position in a secure site. Around 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. And so it was only him and the forward gunner, and they were awake, and they were setting up a position. And they sat there in the quiet night, scanning the darkness for any activity. And it says, then the tiredness and monotony of the scene crept up on them and, and basically threatened to make them fall asleep. In other words, they got sort of settled in. They got a little tired, right? Yeah. And it says, but, however, they were jolted awake when something bizarre stepped out into the night. Okay. So 75 yards away from their position appeared to be a very tall man. Right, yeah, and it startled the soldiers who put on their night vision goggles to identify this potential in, uh, enemy. Yeah, whatever the figure was appeared to be human, and they were wondering whether to open fire or not. When it reportedly turned its head toward them and peered them, peered at them with eyes so bright that it hurt the soldiers' eyes and caused their night vision goggles to malfunction. Okay, so that's kind of creepy, right? Yeah, I mean, what would do that? It has to be really, really bright. <laughs> yeah. He says, the, the thing turned and looked right at me with eyes so bright my night vision started to burn out, meaning that it was so bright it was burning out the system. This is usually done only by really bright stuff like the sun. So that freaked him out. Mm-hmm. And so he pulled off his night vision goggles, right? And those eyes were like neon um, blood red and bright as the sun. So the guy says, so this freaks me out. So I pull out my machine gun over. And drained the thermal optic on it, which is their, their scope on their gun. Yeah. And then basically it says the eyes were so hot that it started to burn out the optic. Same thing as with the night vision goggles. Yeah. Right. But the difference is, though, it's looking for a heat signature. The, the thermal optic, right? Yeah. And it says um, his body, the, the creature's body, was so cold that it stood out from the background, which is really weird. That so, would make me think like something more mechanical. Or, I, I mean, know. kind of, or extremely supernatural. I mean, if it's if its eyes are so if bright, it's a ghoul. Yeah. I mean, so he says I slowly loaded it, loaded it, and when the eyes moved, like he cocked his head at me, and then basically, you know, turned and walked off and was gone. So the dude starts to load his machine gun, and the thing just looked at him, just walked away. Man, I would have tried to pop a shot off. Yeah. I don't know. So, I don't know. And he says, I didn't say a word of this. And when they got back and you know, to anyone. Yeah. What's interesting is Afghanistan does have a history of ghouls. And the description of yep. these tall, skinny, humanoid creatures is common. But these are all from the U.S. military or, you know, military who aren't as embedded in the culture or the region yeah, so as everyone really else. Yeah, they wouldn't really know the folklore. Yeah. They wouldn't really know what to be afraid of. At all. You know what I mean? And there's another one. There's, there's one last one. Where a U.S. Marine, who spent months in Afghanistan combat theater and doing a bunch of different operations, right? Yeah. And he basically wrote, of an, he wrote an article in 2007 for the Salem News entitled Vampires in Afghanistan. <laughs> Soldiers say it's true. According to this guy, during his travels, he met an American soldier at Bagram Air Force Base or Air, Airfield. Yeah. And the soldier asked the dude, King, the guy's yeah. name is King, Tim King. He asked uh, King if he knew about the vampire problem in the area. (laughs) And it's like something a reporter hadn't heard in his entire life, you know, his entire time in the country. He'd never heard it. Yeah. So the guy asked him for more information on what the soldier was actually talking about. And the guy said, um, yeah, vampires were said to live deep in in the desert. And they were quite a bit taller than normal humans. 
and that they were frequently women. Oh. He claimed that the people of the area knew about these sinister creatures for centuries. They come out in the dark, all right, and they stalk you know, the desert badlands and mountains at night looking for victims. And it says in that they were indeed thought for uh, thought to be responsible for people going missing without a trace. So the soldier told a guy, he said, uh, you know, they're really terrified of them. It scares people half to death just to think that one's around. They come out at night. Sometimes people come up missing, especially the kids. They even pull their animals inside when the vampires are out. It's been going on for hundreds of years, and people in other parts of the world don't even know about it. But anyone around here does. Hmm. Who's lived around here does. Uh, and it says the soldier claimed that many uh, military forces operating in the region were also aware of the vampires. And they had seen them on many occasions. It says guys are scared. You know, they don't know, um, they know there isn't any, any, they know that there isn't a thing that anyone can do about it. So if one of them decides to come at you, you just stick with other people and hope for the best. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty crazy, man. So it's like, wow. And they also talk about, um, so with the theme of the vampires prowling the nighttime landscape in the wastelands of Afghanistan, there's another bizarre report where it happened in 2002 where a bunch of uh, U.S. Marines were mapping in caves near Tora Bora, right, where they dropped a huge, like, bomb. Yeah. They were using sonar equipment, and they began having strange interference with their equipment. <clears throat> it had some kind of strange signal coming from within. Yeah. And at first they thought it was some kind of, like, jamming signal. Okay. Coming up and screwing with their equipment, like, from possible, you know, Taliban forces. Yeah. And so they didn't know, right? And so allegedly they went into the darkness to see what was going on. So they, they go into this cave area to try to see kind of what's happening. So they were geared up, and they went in the search for the signal. It says, as they got inside the cave's bowels, um, the corporal, Corporal Wade, reportedly walked into an explosive device, booby trap. Oh, no. Which he broke his back, which is bad. And it says, uh, you know, he started screaming in pain. While the other ones ran uh, to his, to give him some aid. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> they could see that he was not only hurt, but terrified something he had just seen. The fallen soldier claimed that after being injured, as he lay helpless on the cave floor, Something large flown over him, which he said looked like a woman with wings. Huh. And the other Marines thought that maybe the incapacitated wave was loosening from the pain. And after making sure he was okay, they radioed for a rescue team to come get him. And so they went to keep looking for the signal, right? Yeah. And it says, as the two remaining men closed in on the signal, it purportedly suddenly disappeared and then reappeared, approximately at Wade's position. So the two baffled Marines were trying to figure out what was going on. And they suddenly heard gunfire, gunfire coming from Wade, as well as screams of what sounded like terror and pain. So they went back to their fallen buddy. When they when they reached him, they found that Wade had died, yeah, and sustained injuries from what appeared to be a wild animal of some sort. So that sounds like a harpy <laughs> or a vampire. <laughs> well, true, but considering the region, uh, harpies were common in Greek mythology and Byzantine and Persian stuff like that, but. The high pitched noise, that that's Could common be. with those with a lot of the cryptids <clears throat> or supernatural creatures in that area. Yeah. So, it's just the first thing I thought of was like harpy or even a djinn of some sort. Well, those two soldiers yeah. reportedly came across the creature themselves. Yeah. Which was described as being a humanoid being with bat like wings and feminine features. Harpy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was apparently joined by more of them. So whatever these bizarre things were, they were uh, very apparently and also very aggressive. Oh. As they immediately attacked the two Marines who dropped their flashlights in shock and fired their weapons wildly into the darkness. And so when the rescue team they had originally call, called to come retrieve Wade, they originally only found one guy limping out who was brought to medical attention treated for a case of rabies before finally being discharged and sent home. Huh. And the bodies of Wade and Sawyer, which was the other other fellow, were supposedly never found. Huh. Yeah. And it says, the case and a dramatization of those alleged rather dramatic events in the cave were featured on Animal Planet's TV show, Lost Tapes, Season 1, Episode 7. Okay. So you could probably see more of that there. So It's kind of weird, man. So, ghoul, possible harpy, vampire, werewolf. Yeah. Kind of nutty, man. And most of those are more towards the, the supernatural spectrum than yeah. the, like, physical, biological, cryptid type thing that we normally associate with, like yeah. Bigfoot, you know? And there's some more, too, where they talk about in 2011, a 20, uh, an Army sergeant was looking out 
using his night vision stuff, and he um, basically using the thermal scope, and said so he spotted a very large creature about five to six hundred meters away, mm-hmm. and described it to be ape like. So, big and beefy around the shoulders. I don't know, and the heat signature suggested it wasn't wearing clothes. <clears throat> So that's kind of crazy because you don't really expect anything like that out there from what you hear. I mean, it's supposed to be desert, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense. There's weird stuff in New Mexico. Why wouldn't there not be weird stuff in the desert of Afghanistan? It's just these ancient civilization, right? That's the thing. Ancient civilizations like New Mexico or the Southwest, it's, it's like it's got its own flavor or its own type of weird. Yeah. So why why wouldn't someplace like Afghanistan yeah, or Iraq have its own flavor of weird? You and know? there was a yeah, like this guy's like there was a light cast, some headlights, right? They spotted this creature in the headlights of a car mm-hmm. when they were going down the road. It's a cross between a monkey, a dog, and a rat. What what does that look like? A chimera? Maybe. Monkey dog rat. <laughs> But some I mean, sort of like how Hindu, you that? It's like the Hindu thing god. Even, <laughs> some sort. Like a, yeah, it's like a, like a lo- it, So here's how it, and so it's, it got seen again. So it ran across the road and just ignored them. But it, it was see, it had the height of a full grown collie dog, but was hairless. Right, it had a gray body that was emaciated to the point where you could see its ribs. Hmm. The tail was described as long and monkey like, and it had the face of a rat with long teeth. Uh, pointed ears, oversized, luminous gray eyes, and the, eggs, the legs were long and thin. Okay, that is that is a chupacabra with <laughs> mange. That is what that is. That's what that sounds like. But yeah. usually chupacabra, I mean, the only thing it's missing really would be like wings. <laughs> yeah, to be well, like, a classic chupacabra sort of thing. And, well, like the chupacabras that have been recently descri- discovered, if you were to describe them sight unseen, it would be that way. Yeah. Because the skin or droops. Or it could be like a hairless dog man. Yeah, well... Yeah. There's supposed to be a couple different flavors of dogmen, right? But the skin droops it, to the point where the it's mange emaciated. will actually emaciate it and deform its bones to give it the curly tail, that type of stuff. So, yeah. Huh. I don't know. Kind of crazy. Yeah. I was looking at this next article. It was actually published near my birthday. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Mysterious UFOs seen by World War II airmen still unexplained. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah. This was, um, okay. So, once upon a time, there are these things called Foo Fighters. Okay. And these Foo Fighters were sighted by World War II night flyers. Yeah. And these are the guys that would, like, fly at night. That's why they're called night flyers. And they would do the covert nighttime yeah, operations. Yeah, the bombing runs. Yeah, bomb like runs. Cause, yeah. It was, because, yeah. you know, you, if you weren't seen at night, it was easier to drop bombs, I guess, is what the deal was. But, yeah. Um, so, and here's the thing about these Foo Fighters. They were actually seen on both sides as well. And so talking about one of these cases, in November 1944, um, a Bristol bow fighter crew, so they're coming from Bristol, England, right? This is, this is the uh, 415th Night Fighter Squadron. They seen or described described seeing eight to ten bright orange lights flying off the left wing. Yeah. At a high rate of speed. Radar didn't see them. Ground control didn't see them. Now, the radar thing, I wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't surprise me if the radar didn't see them. Because the radar was kind of crude back then. But that's okay. All right. And so they seen them farther away, closer up. They, you know, seen them for a couple couple minutes and they just disappeared. So this guy gave him the name. He basically, he um, came up with the name, taking a nonsense word used by the characters in the popular Smokey Stover firefighter cartoon called Foo Fighters. Okay. So that's where that came from. But there was more reports. And these objects flew along the side of the craft at like 200 miles an hour. They were red or orange or green. Yeah. And they could be appear to be singly or as many as 10 in formation at a time. And they were often outmaneuvered by these... Uh, Things that they were chasing, they never showed up on radar. Hmm. So, and these are professional pilots. These aren't just like, you know, somebody's just willing to make stuff up. And I like how one of the pilots that, that found the sightings unnerving. Yeah. And he, he basically put it in his report that he was scared shitless. You well, know. short of that description or that fact, 
I mean, the observations were fair. They were accurate because these were pilots. Not only were they pilots, but they had to be pretty much the cream of the crop to do these nighttime operations. Yeah. I mean, very specific things like objects flowing alongside the aircraft at 200 miles per hour, the descriptions of the color, the single or formations, and they would accurately describe those formations, <coughs> as well as like the keen observations on how these things would outmaneuver the airplanes that they were chasing. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's got credibility in my opinion, these, these Foo Fighters. And there's a theory that from this guy named Zybart. Yeah. That the reason why they didn't show up on radar is because they're, they're light. That they're made out of light. Huh. And so, and I'm like, I, I don't know if I necessarily, you know, so yeah. I subscribe to that, I guess, but, I mean, who knows? But I thought those were kind of weird with the Foo Fighter things. And also, it's just kind of, you know. <laughs> well, so if the Germans seen the Foo Fighters and everybody else seen the Foo Fighters, if the Germans seen them, you know, you would think, okay, well, the Allied forces are probably um, have something like, maybe it is a light. Like, maybe they're trying to spotlight them or something like that. Yeah. And so, and you think, okay, well, maybe the other side has it too, but it, it wouldn't make sense though. Because, True. I mean, if the light's coming from the ground, you know, it's, there's no way it's going to do or be able to do some of the acrobatics and stuff that it said that it could do. Mm-hmm. And some of these Foo Fighters actually passed through the planes. That was the scary part. Yeah, I, mean, I remember reading go, a description you know, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah an right account through. like that. And light's not going to do that, you know. What a laser! At least light at the time. No, because it would hit. The, it would hit the solid of the. Uh, you know, the you know, the frame, the aircraft yeah. has a solid shape to it, and the laser's not going to go through. It wouldn't burn. If it burned through, it'd leave a mark okay. or something. Huh. And, I mean, a laser that big, would it'd be tremendous. And these were seen all over the place. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know. It's kind of weird. But I, I do think it's funny that, like, the concept or the accounts of Foo Fighters should, much like Memorial Day, never be lost to history. Yeah. I, I would never want them to be lost. And... It's used in modern culture today. We all know the popular band Foo Fighters by Dave Grohl. But there's there's an interesting story besides the great music that we associate it with, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And there was one more, too, about mysterious UFOs seen by World War II airmen. Yeah, that's the one that not, was published near my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and these are, these are not, like, Foo Fighters. You know, these are cigar, cigar-shaped craft, I guess, glowed red and could turn on a dime. And this is near the end of World War II, right? Yeah, but again, that extreme maneuverability is there. So, yeah. Well, remember we also talked about some of the cigar-shaped craft that have, have been allegedly seen in North Carolina. Yes. So. And some and, of the accounts they the deftly earliest, and maneuver around yeah. people and near And one of the mountains. earliest accounts was in the 50s. Yeah. So. So all this is like 1940s through the 1950s. And then we all know Roswell. Yeah. So it's like. Was there just this massive increase in this unexplained flying object phenomenon? I don't know. And see, that's what a lot of people seem to think, that the Nazis had sort of perfected, perfected flying saucers hmm. using a different technology for the you know propulsion. And so they would kind of could do all these maneuvers and stuff like that. But it just seems kind of weird. This is cigar-shaped, and it was kind of the same thing, 8 to 10 of them, that sort of thing. And these were seen around 1944, 1945. And they were said, uh, there's eight to ten of them in a row, glowing fiery orange. Dude seen them off the right wing, that kind of thing. And a lot of the men didn't really want to say anything because they didn't want to be ostracized. But uh, evidently, when they did bring it up, they were taken seriously, which would kind of make sense, right? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, kind of crazy. And this, this little article lays out, like, all these different sightings of just seeing all these Foo Fighters. Some were green, flying in T-shaped formation, you know, Orange, and eventually they they just when they're talking about the name Foo Fighters, where they came from that comic book, you know, yeah, kind of talking about these orange balls flying around. But then what kind of gets me is you know all these different accounts laid out in this article as well as the previous article, but then people try to explain it away, like the Associated Press, they broke a news story in 1945 about the Foo Fighters sightings, yeah. and then tried to explain it away with combat fatigue. And something called St. Elmo's Fire. Yeah. Which is a phenomenon of light appearing on the tips of objects in stormy weather. But 
every member of the 415th rejected all of those theories. Yep. Flares and whether balloons that can't track like planes and objects could, um, those were also some things that were, you know, cited and that also rejected. And it's funny because the weather balloon thing, that's what they said Roswell was. Yeah. So um, there were all these claims that the airmen were suffering from combat fatigue and saying the war stress was driving them insane. But there was scant evidence to suggest a collective psychosis. Yeah. Uh, the 415th had an otherwise excellent record, and when a reporter for American Legion went to report on the squadron, he described them as very normal airmen whose primary interest was combat, and after that came pinup girls, poker, donuts, and the derivatives of the grape, which I assume is wine. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Lieutenant Krasny's son, Keith Krasny, says his late father didn't fit the stereotypical profile of a UFO theorizer. In fact, he never even suggested the glowing, wingless, cigar-like objects that flew near his plane were extraterrestrial in origin. Basically, this person was very level-headed, very analytical, kept a notebook about these experiences, drew out the Foo Fighter sightings, and he was never prone to conspiracy theories. Yeah. So he entertained the idea that it could be a late-breaking German technology. He did express that view that there were a lot of things during the war that were kept very quiet so interesting yeah (laughs) one of the things they were saying also about these these possible food fighter sightings as an explanation was the v2 rocket huh and you know okay so the v2 rocket cigar shaped didn't look to appear to have any wings they you know would be a very rare (laughs) sighting for back then concerning technology was in its infancy so seeing something like that they're like oh yeah you 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 probably just seen the v2 rocket but the explanation doesn't work for that either because the V2 rocket, you would kind of point it in this in the general direction and you'd shoot it. It didn't have maneuverability. Yeah. And every one of these Foo Fighters uh, sightings or descriptions of the events that happened when they encountered these pilots, encountered the Foo Fighters, this thing had a crazy maneuverability. Yeah. The V2 rocket, man, you just kind of shot it in that general direction to hope for the best. You yeah. Know? And this thing has a fireball of thrust behind it. Once you got it fired up and like lit it was gone man it it flew until the fuel went out <laughs> so how can you say that's a foo fighter or describe the v2 rocket as being something to explain whatever this foo fighter thing is when it doesn't have a maneuverability or any of that stuff huh and the germans seen it too hmm you know so it's kind of like well, that's kind of crazy and there's even so, allegedly a picture of a foo fighter that is Shown, it's supposed to be in like 1945 near Carton, Germany, which kind of looks just like this plasma bubble or like a bubble in the air. It doesn't look like a freaking rocket plume to me. But you know, uh, you'll have to take our word for it. Now, we do have links to all of our show notes that we talk about in the show notes section of our podcast. So if you want to click on some of these links and follow along um, or see for yourself, you certainly can. Kind of crazy, right? Yeah. And so when they explained a lot of this as being, you know, basically hysteria, you know, that you're stressed out by the war and all the sort of thing that you're, you know, hysterical, right? And not to be like, you got to get smacked back into reality, sort of hysterical, but just the general overall stress of the situation. The fog of war. Yeah, the fog of war. It's like, <laughs> wow, okay. So that's how they're using to describe that. And then I came across this article, which I thought was kind of crazy. Because it kind of talks about and explains this unexplainable thing the same sort of way. And to be honest with you, it kind of pissed me off a little bit. Really? Yes. So, this article is by the New York Times Magazine, and it says, Was an invisible attack on U.S. diplomats something stranger? Mm. And so, they're basically, the, the okay, so we talked about this before. Actually, we talked about it like twice now. Three times. Yeah. Because I'm a big fan of infrasound. I think it's an infrasound type thing. Anyway. So, German, I mean German, I'm sorry. uh, The United States Embassy officials in Havana, Cuba, in late 2016, reported hearing noises in their homes, right? Yeah. And there was also some reports of like, um, hearing these noises, which happened enough to where they kind of be harassment. There was... uh, Embassies that were staying uh, at a, I mean, the uh, embassy officials were staying at a hotel. I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of foggy on the details, but I remember the Canadians were there. 
U.S. people were there, and these people and some contractors, yeah, some yeah. contractors suffered like what could be considered an attack. And it was weird because, d- despite all the crazier, strange, or unusual explanations, of the sound. If you moved to a different room or walked outside of the buildings that these people were supposed to be living in or working in, the noise stopped. Yeah. The sound, the attack stopped. Yeah. And but, what was weird about this is, you know, they reported it, right? Eventually these people were examined and they do, they had brain damage. Yeah. So there was obvious some indication that something was happening, right? Because they had the headaches, the fatigue, dizziness, mental fog, hearing loss, nausea, and freaking brain damage. And not just brain damage, but I guess like an earologist, because I can't pronounce the word, <laughs> at the University of Miami, yes. told many of them they had actual damage to their inner ears, vestibul- vestibular organs. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not just the brain damage. The initial reports showed damage to their ears. Yeah, so they had hearing and brain damage. Yeah. And so when they brought this up at the American Embassy... You know, this, the guy, De Laurentiis, who was running the show over there, if I remember, he was, um, anyway, he, he sort of let it out there and said, hey, there might be something going on, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they didn't, <laughs> okay, so they put it out there, if you've experienced something, let's talk about it. And they go into this room that they have, which is basically the embassy secret compartmentalized or compartmented information facility, which is like an inner sanctum where it's supposed to be like, yeah. You know, communications and stuff can't get in or out. It's supposed to be like a safe place, right? And they had like 60 people in there. Yeah. Saying that, yes, they had heard stuff. Right? Including family members. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's what's crazy, right? It says, okay, so the guy, he, he called a meeting of his senior staff to tell them what was going on. And he insisted that they tell nobody else, not even their families, which had the perverse effect of heightening the staff member's anxiety rather than calming it. Yeah. And within days, he felt, De Laurentiis felt, compelled to call an open meeting of the staff and this when they all went in there. Yeah. And this is this is the part I have a problem with. Right out of the gate, you know, you're reading this and you're like, okay, you're in the first paragraph and the very first thing the New York Times says it had a perverse effect. Yeah. Or there was a sense of hysteria and concern. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> hold on a second. Yeah. So they talked about it, you know, and, and then they say, well, you know, a government official who worked in Havana at the time said, well, perhaps hysteria is the wrong word. It was really more concern and fear. Why are you just telling us this now? This whole article kind of goes down and basically starts to paint a picture that the people who experienced this and their family members who heard this sort of thing, this, this whatever this is happening. As have, mass hysteria. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny to me because the last article we read on this said, you know, the attacks that happened on these people where they actually had physical damage yeah. was caused by crickets. And then... Remember and, that? Yeah. Crickets. And what really heightened everybody's concern was before that, there was like a genuine, you know, genuine concern for this pe- these people. They were all mass evacuated. And it was Canada, France, and America. Yeah. I mean, even French officials and Canadian officials, they went home. These buildings were evacuated. Yeah, and the United States expelled 15 Cuban diplomats from yeah. the embassy in Washington, too. Said, so you got to go. Yeah. <coughs> because so, they were saying that there was no... The Cubans were like, we didn't find, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't find anything. And <laughs> they said, okay, it's crap, right? So yeah. they got them all out of there because I guess they felt they'd been compromised. And then it goes into this article and says that, you know, they talked to physicists and all these other people and that there's no technology that exists or could exist to cause this. Yeah. And I'm like, hold on a second. Sonar. Sonar. Sound in the water. Yeah. Sonar stands for sound navigation and ranging. You have different frequencies you can use and all this other stuff without getting too deep into it. You can basically kill a diver with sonar. Yeah. You can turn their brains into jelly. So, and they're like, well, and they make the assumption that you would have to use like a microwave transmitter to send this directed energy, this invisible weapon, this invisible energy beam to the person. To cause this problem. No. They don't even... They don't even... Explore, like, actual sound yeah. manipulation. There is sound that we, as older people, can't hear. That younger people can. It's annoying. Right? They play it in some places to keep the kids from loitering around, right? 
<laughs> There's also some like ultrasound that we can't freaking hear. You know, Mm -hmm. and there's infrasound, which allegedly Bigfoot has, where he can basically yell and you feel it in your chest and it scares the crap out of you. It's like, and there's also these things called bats that can emit high frequency sound, right? Bounces off a bug. They know where to go get the bug. Same thing with a tree. It's how they navigate. Well, like. So it doesn't have to be freaking microwaves. I don't understand, you know. And like the bats, the first thing I thought of is when we saw the bat outflight. All of you were like, wow, it's really loud. And I couldn't hear any of it because yeah. I'm, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> but you could feel it. I felt the effect, yeah. you know. Um, and that's another part of this article that I have the problem with. Of the roughly 80 people tested, 12 were found to have the ear issues similar to the, what the first two uh, officials had experienced months earlier. But a few did not hear noises. Well, hey, I'm an example of someone who can't hear a lot of the noises. Yeah. Um, and some who described other more subtle sounds, including one that called to mind the experience of vibrating air pressure in a car with a single open window in the back. Yeah. That's that's a very good description right there. And that's what you wouldn't be able to hear it at all, but you'd be able to feel its effects. Yeah. It's like a little microphone. You know, a microphone doesn't hear sound at all. It basically reacts to pressure, which... That pressure is the same sort of thing as they just described. Yeah. And what I did not like about this article is it said dozens of leading neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists have offered an alternative narrative that the diplomats' symptoms are primarily psychogenic or functional in nature. So they're saying that the confluence of physiological, I mean, I'm sorry, psychological and neurological processes, the entirely subconscious yet remarkably powerful Underlying hypnosis and the placebo effect are all disorders, right? So, in other words, the br- it's not the brain's hardware, but it's software. Not of the objective injuries to the brain structure, but of chronic alterations in how the brain functions, typically following exposure to an illness, physical injury, or stress, is what's causing this. So, they're saying that they these people have a functional neurological disorder. All of them? Yeah. Which is basically misunderstood as debilitating and uh, denigrated ailments that it can cause. And then they use an example about a 15-year-old French girl in 1881 who broke a pane of glass. <laughs> right? And it gave her a slight cut on the back of her left hand. The wound healed in four or five days. But by then, her fingers had contracted into the shape of a cup. Right? With her thumb pressed against her index finger. And it remained that way. A veritable club hand for an entire year. What? Because she had such stress about it that her brain subconsciously gave her that debilitating uh, physiological effect, right? So in other words, the physical effect of the hand being clenched into that shape was caused by the stress of breaking the glass. So her mind subconsciously gave her that malady, if you will. And they're saying, oh, yeah, that's what happened to those guys. So this psychological malady. So they call it hysteria, right? Yeah. The same exact identical malady affected over 80 people or however many people that aren't all related. The only thing they have in common is whatever job, con- and not even that. Uh, they kind of just, the only thing these people had in common was where they were currently working or living. Yeah. I mean, they come from all different backgrounds. They have different jobs. Yeah. I And you're describing something that would be congenital or hereditary you, or specific it yeah or specific. specific to the individuals yeah. and the individual's mental makeup yeah and and there's also like a section that says news and they're, they're breaking this down and sort of attacking this narrative of what was put out in the news before by this article from the new york times news report cited an official theory that it basically attributed the symptoms to a sonic attack using some sort of a visible energy force like something out of star wars like sound basically right yeah. sonic attack and then they go in and they describe you know, about a different neurological perspective, right? Psychiatric theories of Sigmund Freud. And they kind of keep going. Read and about they, 18 students who started twitching uncontrollably in New York. Yeah. And then it bring out the term psychogenic. You know, so now they have to say, okay, so in order to explain how these 18 individuals suffered the same effects, they had to go through and they put this out here. Right? Psychogenic effect. Right? Persistent post post Persistent postural perceptual dizziness, yeah. PPPD. 
So they keep on going, and they're breaking everything that these people suffered, uh, and they're, they're excluding the brain injury, basically, at this point, and saying it's, it's a subset of, phys- of functional disorders. But that also is awesome. And then, and then they say, okay, so now they have to explain the energy part of it, the, in, the invisible energy weapon part of it, right? Mm-hmm. And then after they do all this stuff, it says the usual suspects are anything from ultrasound, infrasound, and microwave. Those are things that could potentially affect the brain. But physicists and engineers who specialize in the effect on humans of such technology disagree. And they say this person named Rick Tell, who spent basically more than 50 years studying and helping to set uh, an international standards of safe exposure limits to electromagnetic, ra- electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Basically says, if a guy is standing in front of a high-powered radio antenna, and it's got to be high, really high, yeah. then he can experience his body getting warmer. But to cause brain tissue damage, you would have to impart enough energy to heat it up to the point where it's cooking. And I don't know how you could do that. I don't know how you could do that, especially if you're trying to transmit through a wall. It's just not plausible. Um, it is possible, plausible if you're not using microwave or electromagnetic energy. Yeah. You know, and you know, microwave basically cooks from the inside out. It's a form of radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation. And so, and they also talk about how the U.S. military has tested beams of powerful microwaves as a crowd control device, but the process works not by penetrating the brain, but by heating people's skin surface so quickly that they run from it as soon as the device picks on. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's great and all. That's just one aspect of what these people were experiencing. Yeah. And it's not necessarily the only technology that could be out there. And it this is what I don't understand. It's like, why are you poo-pooing this whole but thing? Then, and they keep offering these these overly, overly indulged theories as explanations yeah. to explain away certain parts of one overall situation. But they only pick apart at certain things, and they still don't really truly address the biggest thing if this, they don't, they don't if, talk about sound yeah. and they don't talk about infrasound i mean they go so far as to talk about suggestion like the power of suggestion about you know people who might see a news item on multiple sclerosis and then the next week end up in a wheelchair or having like cognitive behavioral therapy and then doing like psychological evaluations they just keep picking apart these these little things, whereas my greatest issue of this is there's no way that this could be mass hysteria when you had so many different groups of people being affected by this one one significant event. Yeah, and it's, you know, basically um, it happened in China, too. Yeah. Because the U.S. State Department has now identified 26 U.S. diplomats and family members as having become sick, right? Yeah. One additional case was done in China. And the lady, whose name is Catherine, Catherine Warner, said, I'm not really doing too well. Yeah. Okay. So she got ill while she was in China. Said, My balance is so impacted. I need certain aids to help me. I now use a balance vest and a cane. It's something I'm struggling with because I'm only 32. I went from managing a team of very smart, driven individuals and working on a really tr- critical trade policy and promotion issues to not being able to recall very basic words not being able to process very simple tasks and problems my whole life has been derailed. And that kind of talks about the... And she talks about what she heard, though. This yeah. is what makes hers a little bit different. She said, I experienced a very low, very low pulsing sound, mostly at night. It was waking me up. I thought at first it was air, air conditioning making a funny noise. It sounded mechanical, like a very low humming but oscillating sound. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's like sonar, man. Yeah. The other symptoms are really interesting, too, because these actually relate to something that they talked about on Mysterious Universe as well. Um, Her symptoms included tinnitus, nausea and dizziness, as well as um, hives and nosebleeds. Her hair started to fall out in clumps. She felt really sick. And that particular area of China, isn't that what they talked about on Mysterious Universe with the other guy? It may have been. I don't know. I think so. Or they may have referenced that yeah. Um, when they talked about the Canadians, because the Canadians had a problem with, with their people, too, bringing their number to at least 15. Yeah. So we're looking at, like, what, 41, 42 people so far? Yeah. So the explanations of neurological effects and stuff like that, you know, basically it's all, like, hysteria 
and everything they laid out is is garbage, man. These people experienced something. They were attacked. I know. You know, I mean, sonar, you know, you can you can basically send a beam of sound into the water and it'll hit a submarine. You know, of course, depending on the power output frequency and all, it, you know, basically intensity or attenuation, all that stuff sort of factors into it. But when it hits, it sounds like somebody smashing the side of your ship or your submarine, your, you know, the hull, like with a sledgehammer. And that's just sound. And you've watched the old World War II movies, right? Yeah. You ping, bang, ping. I mean, come on. And to sit there and say that, you know, these people didn't experience anything and then it's not possible because it's not using microwave energy or energy from electromagnetic radiation. Well, maybe that's not the energy type of weapon that it was at all. It's it, Maybe it's sound. I just, I don't like. It's, this is <sighs> crap. This is garbage. This I, is a garbage article. <laughs> I just don't like that the explanation is being chalked up to something that's been trending in the news and in modern culture, yep. which is psychological trauma. Yeah. This is psychological trauma. Everything's in your head. No, not everything is in your head. Some trauma is actually inflicted by either an unseen force or an unknown force. Yeah. Not all trauma is in people's heads. So, and there's uh, you know, the idea that the diplomats have a functional disorder is firmly rejected by not only the State Department but other diplomats that this person has spoken to. So, you got one person basically saying they were trying to talk to people, right? Even submitted a, a uh, Freedom of Information Act, yeah. And you know, that the person eventually received 79 pages of material. Um, and basically, he this person rejects it. I'm not sure what the guy's name is, I think his name is Hallett. Yeah, but you know, so you got one person who's basically saying, "No, this is garbage, man. This is you know, obviously attack." <laughs> you know. Yeah. And the idea that diplomats have a functional disorder is firmly rejected by not only the State Department officials, by other diplomats that they spoke to, and the doctors who treated them, who are convinced that these symptoms were caused by something external, physical, real. Yeah. So. And now there is one redeeming line in here, and. Because it, it kind of leaves an open what if, and that is, what if the State Department, the pen doctors, and the diplomats themselves are wrong, and those who see the possibility of an outbreak of functional disorders are right? So it tries to spin, while I disagree with the statement, it tries to spin <coughs> its own, and I hate to say it, its own conspiracy theory. The New York Times is trying to say there's a conspiracy of a outbreak of functional disorders in large mm. groups of people that suggestion right there from this large newspaper is frightening to me mm. because it is suggesting large groups of people can experience a functional disorder like hysteria and that it's extremely commonplace that's what i read from that sentence well and i also kind of read like this and they're saying that if people have a functional disorder it's obviously very damaging to tell people that they have a brain injury because if you tell people that they have a brain injury, it's not going to help them if they actually have a functional disorder mm -hmm. and it can stop them from getting the therapy that might help them. This is conditioning <laughs> us. This is an attempt to condition us. Yeah. So they're like, Oh, if you tell people they have a brain injury, but they really have something else, they're not going to seek the help that they want. My thing is they're just, okay, well, that's great and all, but, they have a freaking injury. It shows up. <laughs> this is discounting one theory and instead slowly proposing another theory. That's where I'm like, oh, you slick. That's where I'm like, okay, you're trying okay. to be slick. Now, here's the part that yeah. really gave me the red ass. <laughs> okay? Yeah. This guy that wrote the article, Dan Hurley, mm -hmm. is a science journalist and longtime contributor for the magazine. And we're talking about the New York Times Magazine. Yeah. He is writing a book about the history of functional disorders. Huh. Huh. So this guy so obviously that... has a vested interest to take this interesting news article about something that's still considered crazy, right? It, yeah. I mean, this is sort of some crazy thing. We still don't know what's going on. It's, it's weird. It's wacky, right? It's crazy. Yeah. It had to tailor it. To show people and tell people about functional disorders because he's writing a book about it. You mean an alternate agenda? Yeah. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Yeah. And the article is very long. And it's it's subjective, of course. 
and he keeps coming back to trying to pump, pump out this functional disorder thing. And I get down to the very bottom, and it says, oh, he's writing a book on it. I'm like, you piece of garbage. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, the New York Times Magazine and this particular art- article is a little self-serving, and I think it's sort of disrespectful to the people who've experienced this attack and had obvious issues from it. And these are diplomats. You know, these are people that are in service for our country. And then you have this this guy writing an article about this, denigrating it down to a functional issue. But no, he's really writing a book about whatever he's calling this. What was it? Was it um, about the functional disorders? Which is interesting because... So it's like, are you freaking kidding me? Functional disorder as put on Wikipedia, was only recently edited as of May 5th, 2019. And I'm just wondering here, as I go up and look at this news article, when did this news article come out? And then functional neurological disorders. This news article come out, yeah. by, uh, or this article, I shouldn't call it a news article, this article in the New York Times Magazine by Dan Hurley was May 15th. And then... 2019. It's further expanded upon in... Functional Neurological Disorders on Wikipedia, edited, last edited, May 22nd, 2019. Huh. Hmm. Because I was like, functional disorder, I've only heard that terminology used for certain things, like um, chronic fatigue and things like that. Not necessarily a neurological thing. Yeah. But hey, look, look at all these new edited entries. Interesting. So, yeah. Interesting. What an agenda. Yeah. So I kind of thought it was garbage. Mm-hmm. You know, and I read it like a couple different times. I skimmed it. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. And I go back and skim different parts of it. Yeah. So maybe I'm misreading this whole thing. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> thought it was garbage. So garbage. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. I know we've been rambling for quite a while. And if you've been sticking around or hanging around and you've made it to the very end, Give yourself a pat on the back because you deserve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyway, I think I've done just about as much damage as I can do <laughs> today in this podcast. <laughs> so, having a hard time with speaking and all that. Yeah. So, now we do want to remind everybody uh, the Spruce Pine Alien Conference and Expo is happening June 14th and 15th. Free admission to the general public. However, if you'd like to see Mike Barra, who we mentioned earlier in this podcast episode, talk he's going to be doing two separate talks those are twenty dollars and you can actually sign up for those talks buy tickets on the spruce pine alien conference and expo website Uh, it's going to be a pretty interesting thing we also feature our chance to talk with robert starch storch Storch from wonderfy that's going to be on our youtube channel and he talks about the vision behind having a ufo conference and expo in a place like spruce pine north carolina Yes. Yeah. Now, can you think of anything else that we need to, or we should cover? I mean, it's late. <laughs> it's late for us. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I believe in this weird Wednesday segment that we're going to be having coming up, we're going to be talking about part one of the Brown Mountain Lights. Oh, yeah. So that'll be coming up on our weird Wednesday podcast, which usually has a weird Wednesday video on our YouTube channel. Mm. So, but uh, other than that, if you're listening and today is Memorial Day, well, happy holiday. Yeah. If you have a chance to take a second around 3 o'clock in the afternoon and remember those who've uh, given, uh, well, basically given everything in the service of their country. Uh, the ultimate a, sacrifice. Remembrance. Yeah. It would be nice. So. Other than that, enjoy your holiday. If mm-hmm. you're listening to us after the fact and you have any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. Yep. Other than that, I think I'm, I'm good. Are you good? Nope. I uh, just... Thanks for listening, everybody. If you want to reach out, again, we have contact information in the show notes or just reach out, contact at creepgeeks.com, and be sure to like us on Facebook. Yes. Okay. Anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.